by moi, Elizabeth M. Ibarra. Welcome to class. It's wonderful to have you here with me. Um, we're going to have some wonderful things to discuss today. Um, here is the class outline so you know what to expect during class and what the flow will be. If you have a notepad and pen with you or a notebook, this would be a great time to have that ready. We will begin with a guided manifestation, then I will discuss the mythos of Athena, then we'll go over the significance of our archetypal voice, ways to invoke Athena, journaling prompts, and an open forum at the end of class where those of you who are live with me will be able to go ahead and have an in-depth discussion about what you feel about what you've been learning today. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. We will begin with a guided manifestation. So typical meditation style. If you want to keep your um, recording going for your video, that's fine. If you're more comfortable shutting that off while you meditate, that's up to you. Um, so what I'd love for you to do is if you could plant your feet on the ground, roll your shoulders back, take a few deep cleansing breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth, and close your eyes if you are able to Athena, Pallas Athena, Athena Nike, gray-eyed Athena, great and powerful goddess of warfare, wisdom, womanly arts, and peace. Be with us here in the sacred circle of women on the path of the heroic journey towards self-empowerment. Allow us to feel more connected to our observant, clear-headed, strategic mindset as we face the obstacles in our paths. Allow us to use our creativity, inspiration, and willpower to weave our own stories on our terms as empowered women with powerful grace of your presence within us. Protect us as we venture outside our comfort zones to make new discoveries, to be engaged in the process of becoming warrioresses of golden light, of peace, art, love, nurturing, protection, and commitment to our goals, our visions of the very highest forms of our self-expression and mastery of our skills. Athena with owl, olives, laurels, and Nike's victory. Be on our side as we honor the deeply powerful voice you manifest within us. We gather together as a sisterhood to grow, to make discoveries, and to uplift each other. We do so now in the sacred space of great Athena. Take a few deep cleansing breaths, and when you are ready, you may open your eyes and join us in this sacred circle in harmony. Welcome. It is really an honor to have the three of you here with me live today. And for everybody watching on the replay, I appreciate your support. Allow me to get into the wonderful nuances of this very, very powerful ancient Greek goddess. Athena is one of the goddesses I personally have always felt a fascination towards and a resonation with um, while growing up as a girl. I uh, had the incredible opportunity at the age of 11 to spend a winter in Greece with my parents. And while in Greece, touring around the mainland and going to the Acropolis and having the experience of spending a winter on an island in the Cyclades, 
I absolutely felt the mystery and the power of the ancient gods in the natural world around me and experiences experienced many of them and what I personally felt I witnessed to be signs of how the ancients would have experienced and felt the power of the ancient gods, of the Olympian pantheon, the demigods, and all. And for me, I felt at that time very connected to Athena from her perspective of being a protector and a watcher and a guide towards wisdom and empowerment. And I still do to this day as an artist feel incredibly connected to this goddess. And um, if you have ever had any experience with the myths, um, I think you'll know why I, I talk about that. So Athena, um, is given a lot of epithets, one of them Pallas Athena. Um, Athena Nike is one of them. Um, Athena Nike refers to Athena herself in conjunction with the winged goddess Nike, which is who is the goddess of victory. So Athena and Nike together were warfare and you know victory or victory of you know wisdom, of protection, of all the incredible things, the womanly arts. It was a very powerful um, double connotation. And inside the incredible uh, Parthenon and in the, the temples there, there were representations of the goddesses and the goddess and it, she was incredible. There was a giant statue of Athena, um, which had been resplendent and covered with gold and clothed and in her outstretched hand was the statue of the winged goddess Nike. So it's a very powerful image. Um, she's also associated with owls, which are her sacred totem animal. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you notice the symbolism of owls around you, in my eye and living where we live in the desert, there are owls and we've had some really marvelous sort of mystical experiences in that sense. Um, I feel like Athena is watching over us or guiding us with some pretty mega power. Before Athena became the patron goddess of Athens, and I will get into that myth of how that happened, I would like to go back to the beginning of her story. The god Zeus is the king of the Olympian gods, god of thunder, of the skies, and he had a wandering eye, to put it lightly, and although he was wed to his sister goddess Hera, who was the queen of the gods, he did create a lot of progeny with other goddesses, demigoddesses, and mortals alike. So there are different versions of the myth, and I like the, um, the Hesiod version of this. This is the one I, I grew up with, where um, Zeus having heard a prophecy that he would have an offspring that would overthrow him when the goddess Metis of wisdom specifically um, was pregnant, he swallowed her whole. Keeping in tradition with the, the creation story of the Olympian gods, how um, the offspring of the Titans, Kronos and Rhea, also went through the same thing. Kronos was paranoid about being overthrown by one of his offspring, so he swallowed them whole. And Zeus actually was the only one who didn't have that fate because his mother uh, fed her husband a rock wrapped in swaddling clothes instead and hid Zeus. So Zeus freed the rest of his siblings, but still went back to some of that old ancient god way of paranoia by swallowing the, off, the potential offspring. So that's one way of looking at that, right? It was also a way for him to incorporate wisdom within himself by swallowing wisdom, correct? So you get that double meaning there. Meanwhile, Athena starts to come forth, but she's trapped inside of Zeus. She starts screaming war cries, banging on a golden shield, which she already had with her, you know, suspension of disbelief, the gods' stories are just magnificent and magical, and giving her, her father an excruciating migraine. There was nothing that would stop it, so he begged his brother, Hephaestus, the god of the smith, to smash his head open, anything really. He said, anything you can do to relieve this pain. So Hephaestus smashed his head open with his, his smith hammer, and out of Zeus's forehead, remember all of you who are watching this, they're immortal, okay? 
suspension of disbelief, magical thinking here. Out of his forehead sprang a fully armored and clad Athena in all her glory, screaming her battle cry, gorgeous, clothed in gold. She was so brilliant that even Helios the sun dimmed in comparison to this great goddess. And Zeus was in awe of her and also intimidated given what he knew, he gave Athena different armor to wear. He's like, here, take my armor instead. Yours is way too bright to be out there uh, outshining me. So it's an interesting um, way of bringing in to the world this incredible goddess who is a virgin goddess, meaning that she did not uh, choose to associate herself. She remained intact. She did not want to be cons uh, consort to um, a male deity or to marry or to bear children. Um, there's more to that as we get along. But she kept unto herself like the virgin goddesses. She was whole um, in that and didn't feel the need to have that romantic or um, you know marital status as a goddess she stayed intact unto herself which is very powerful she's one of the virgin goddesses in the pantheon and it has like multiple facets to her being uh, a goddess of wisdom being that she is the goddess of wisdom itself within her father zeus emerging from his head you can imagine her being this incredible goddess of the mind of of clear mindset clear vision she's uh gray-eyed um and was one of her epithets is gray-eyed athena very clear-sighted and um visionary and uh, her her emotional kind of presentation we can think of her being collected calm albeit a bit sometimes stern but not in an incompassionate way because she's always planning always thinking very very engaged in all of her tactical abilities her skills and she is a very uh forthright presence what you see with athena is what you get as it is with all of pretty much all of the pantheon there's not much subterfuge about athena so she is a warrior goddess a warrioress powerful and not like um aries who is like the the god of visceral warfare like the physical act of being a warrior she is tactical she's the one who could plan strategy battles um she is the one who inspired helped protected and gave magical gifts to who would then become the heroes and heroines within greek mythology she would watch out for her favored ones the ones who were loyal to her and would help them achieve glory so there's a lot to her mythology because she's not just that she is also a protector as well as a fighter right so she becomes the patron goddess of athens after um she and poseidon were trying to decide who would vie for that position her uncle poseidon the goddess of the sea emotional very powerful also known as earth shaker and god of horses so very powerful god the oldest of the the brothers of the three gods that have the different uh, he had the ocean, Zeus had the heavens, Hades had the underworld. So Poseidon was kind of like the middle realm, which is pretty powerful. Um, and he he challenged Athena to a, a godly duel, so to speak, to come up with uh, what would be the best gift to give to the mortals, and then the mortals would have a hand in, in having this decision, making this choice, right? So... Poseidon, feeling very pleased with himself, brought up his trident, struck the ground, and created a spring, which provided water and rivulets and brought water to the city. Pretty impressive. But Athena, the wise goddess that she is, created the most magnificent gift, which I have seen in person. They are magnificent. She created the first olive tree. An olive tree provides shade for the heat of the summer days. An olive tree provides fruit which can be cured and eaten. Olives themselves can be pressed to create oil. 
And then thus, when the tree has waned, it can be cut, cured, and made into wood for building purposes. There's not a lot of wood in Greece. So it was uh, a really amazing gift and creation that would just keep on giving. And she was chosen at that point to be the patron goddess of Athens, a very wise gift indeed. And um, I have witnessed in person all over Athens, um, the incredible, beautiful olive trees when, when they flutter in the wind, all those beautiful oblong leaves, they're olive green on one side. And when they flip the other way, they have this beautiful silvery gray tone, like the eyes of Athena, very beautiful. So that's part of her mythology. Now, as I said before, she never wed and she maintained herself, but she fought it off. She fought off other advances, including by her uncle Poseidon. And she wiped the sperm away, fought him off. He did not consummate this connection with her, but she technically had a child because the sperm fell onto Gaia and out of Gaia then produced an offspring. And Athena took this child and mentored it like you know of course being from this traumatic experience but she was a tough chick you know she is not one to be messed with athena was not overthrown by poseidon so though she never married and never took a lover and never technically bore a child she had an interesting an interesting way of again the the magical realism that is the story of of the ancient gods right um so she has aided, okay, and, and when you look at the myths, she aided the most famous heroes of the ancient myths, Perseus, Heracles, Belafron, and Jason. Now, there's, of course, Jason and the Argonauts, um, and... Heracles, of course, we all know Heracles and all of his, you know, incredible things that he had to achieve in order to prove himself to the gods, right? And she helped him. And Perseus's story is very interesting because it's kind of a twofold thing. Once again, we have a beautiful goddess, a demigoddess, a, a lower goddess, not one of the Olympians, but another goddess who was being put upon um, because she was so beautiful. Um, she was put upon and forced upon by again poseidon some history there some animosity and because she was so beautiful uh there was a lot to that and it, the, her, the temple was defiled and there was a lot to that and it, it angered athena and athena was not so sympathetic toward this goddess and turned medusa into a gorgon which was a terrifying looking beast-like creature uh, with hair of snakes. So that then caused, you know, this one action then caused a lot of terrible things to happen after the fact, uh, where Medusa was turning people into stone and causing terror and havoc among the mortals. So she inspired Perseus and gave him divine gifts to borrow, some to use, um, her golden shield, the winged sandals of her brother Hermes, the messenger god, half-brother, um, and uh, a spear, and sent him, or sword, depending on which way he was fighting, and sent him off to go fight off Medusa. And then when he is able to subdue Medusa by reflecting or deflecting her gaze in the shield and all of the trickery he has to do to finally get there, it turns out that when Medusa was transformed into the Gorgon, she was pregnant. Again, all these unbelievable stories of births of, of, of incredible magical creatures. And out of the wound in her neck from being slain, two incredible creatures emerge. And one of them is Chrysair, a, a giant wielding a golden sword, big giant. The other one is the divine and incredible winged horse, Pegasus. I think Poseidon, god of horses, a winged, divine, beautiful horse, whom Perseus then ends up riding and becomes part of a lot of the mythos. Um, 
there is also the story of the Iliad and Athena um, favored certain warriors in that. And she aids um, the Grecian side in this, favoring them, of course. So she helps Menelaus, the, the original husband of Helen, who becomes not transforms from Helen of Sparta into Helen of Troy during the Iliad when she's taken by Prince Paris to Troy. And so there is that there. She she watches out for Menelaus, helps guide him. She helps Achilles. Um, and we all know that Achilles is the ultra powerful warrior, save for his heel, the one part of him that was fallible. And uh, that was a problem for his undoing. And then Odysseus, um, who went through an, a terrible thing. He forgot to, in the glory after the battle, he forgot to pour wine on the sea and ask for, you know, blessing and give thanks. Uh, they rushed off and that caused a lot of problems because he insulted Poseidon and some of the other gods along the way. And Athena still managed to look out for him in his harrowing journey home. She did aid him in that. So she plays a pivotal role in the story of Odysseus and his Odyssey. And uh, ever since the Renaissance, Athena has become an international symbol of wisdom, the arts, and classical learning. You think of her as, you know, being very wise, very learned, scholarly. Um, she's used as a symbol of freedom and democracy. Now we think, again, all of that, the, the warrior, the tactician, the planning, all of those things, the goal-oriented achievement, um, mastery of skills, right? She's a master of anything she sets out to do. Uh, and she's an artist. So it wasn't only the cerebral things and the, the tactical abilities and the warfare. She had a has a very incredible connection to what was called the womanly arts, which was artisan craft, weaving specifically is her masterful gift, pottery, painting, um, other handicrafts, so anything where the hands were used, like all the fiber arts, textiles and such. Um, those are her domain and she she presided over those and you know had a wonderful time being among all that energy, save for one particular instance when a lovely mortal, uh, Arachne was boastful that she was better than Athena at weaving. And they set up a duel, a weaving duel, to see who was indeed the best weaver. And it is commonly known throughout the myths, you do not insult the Olympian gods. It's just not done. And that's what Arachne set up to do. She, she set up follies of the gods, their, their foibles, their flaws, the brutal things they did to mortals. And Athena, on the other hand, was weaving all of the heroic things of the gods, the good things and the wonderful things. And when Athena saw what Arachne did, she was very angry. She tore the weaving up and used her magic to turn this spiteful creature into a spider, the first spider ever weaving webs, always ensnaring prey, and feared by many arachnids. That's where we get the term arachnid from arachne and the first spider. A lot of ancient cultures have the spider myth, and usually in a more positive light than this particular story. But in this one, it was proof that it is very important for mortals to know their station and to be respectful and uh, to honor in those ancient cultures. There was all about you must honor them. You must give them the station of respect they deserve. And when you do so, they will bless you with their divine brilliance and wonderful gifts. So... Athena is all that. She's amazing. And um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about her archetypal significance. 
because of course I'm not literally talking about the archetype of the warrior as as in we literally need to be in the armed services. Although there are some women who probably are Athena archetypes who are in the armed services attracted to that kind of aspect of this archetype, but it's not the only manifestation. Excuse me. The archetype within is where we can go to when we want to access Athena energy. We attempt to calm our minds, to step out of our over-emotional space and to be more of an observer of what's happening dispassionately with wisdom and grace. When we think of her from the emotional standpoint, and I think of her as being an emotional protector too, which isn't to say that rage, forcefulness, and energy, passion are not part of the Athena archetype. They are, but it's almost like being able to know when to pick your battles and when to step back and be a little bit more detached and wise and observe the situation before making a decision or a response. Athena is a master. So she is the master of whatever she sets out to attain. So what your expertise personally is with your gifts, with your arts, with your profession, the Athena archetype is the ultimate expression of being able to master them, be incredible at what you do, and achieve great and wonderful things with incredible amounts of respect when you're following that path, when you're really activating and using that Athena energy. It's really, really beautiful, really powerful energy. And it's calm, but a little dangerous sometimes, you know, she can be a little scary like a lot of the gods. So it's important to temper that energy within yourself and know how to keep that warrior-esque energy right in check when you need to fight, when you need to stand in your power and advocate for yourself and your needs. Athena is the one to use because it's usually balanced. It's usually from the place of not usurping other people. But standing in your power, the power stance, right? And declaring who you, exactly, yeah, the power stance opens up your heart chakra, opens up your crown chakra, and you say, I am me. And this is what I am, who I am, what I stand for, and these are my needs. And if I'm not getting them met, how can I? And seeking those answers. And the Athena archetype is excellent for, you know, like being everyone's favorite aunt. You know, I could think of that that way. And which doesn't mean that an Athena doesn't fall in love in this archetypal sense within a mortal, within a normal person. Just because you're an Athena doesn't mean you're going to be a virgin your whole life. It means or choose not to marry, although there may be some that don't. There may be some that choose to keep to themselves, and that's perfectly within that spectrum. All of those virgin goddess um can have that as an attribute. Women who choose not to associate themselves with a partnership. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that. It, it, it means that while you're in the, the connection of a partnership, a marriage, a commitment, a relationship as a parent too, that there's also this sort of a, a space within Athena that's pretty collected. Um, not necessarily the most overly, not like a Demeter who is like ultra nurturing, right? But an Athena would be ultra supportive as a parent. One of the one that like, okay, what kinds of activities are going to inspire you? How can I support you in achieving those? And yeah, let's go for it. You can do this. I will support you along the way because I believe in you. That would be like the parenting style I think of when I think of an Athena. One who... Uh, a, admires education, but isn't just cerebral about it, one who also loves the arts. We can't take out the arts when we think of the intellect when it comes to Athena. She's an artist. So it may be that if one watching this or experiencing this, experiencing this is, is an artist in some form or another, and I know some of you are, <laughs> myself included, that the Athena archetype is going to be very present when you're creating. 
when you're using that mind skill to bring your thoughts and your energies out through your hands to create something incredible, whatever that art form may be. So there is all of that. There is that being able to go inward, connect with your third eye, your inner eye, your inner knowing to be confident and at peace with who you are in a situation. So when you're out of balance, when you might be having a situation where you don't feel like you're in control, if you feel like you're in this place that's put you out of your comfort zone, or you feel like for some reason you're in the situation where you're feeling like a victim, for whatever reason that might be, and I'm assuming just emotionally, the Athena archetype is there for you to access. And she's always there. We just sometimes get distracted by the chatter. You have the ability to slay your inner demons when they come up by using that incredible deep knowing that comes with the Athena. And we all have that inner knowing about ourselves when we look at ourselves authentically. And it's not all sunshine and rainbows, my lovelies. Sometimes we have dark stuff that comes up, our shadows, and it's part of who we are. But when we're in the space of bringing it to the light, using that golden energy, that wild, you know, dim the sun golden energy of Athena, we have the ability to shed the light in all of those nooks and crannies within our psyches and find the answers to who we really are and who we want to be and, and then uh, uh, decide to act accordingly. But this is, of course, this takes practice. This isn't just a, 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 an easy thing to do. I don't try to make it seem like it is. It takes work to recognize which arch archetypal voice you want to use in the moment to practice what I personally call emotional alchemy. So if you're in those situations where you feel burdened by a situation, if you do not feel in control of what you're doing, if you are being pushed upon by people who are trying to push you into a corner to be something that you're really not, Athena is there, just ready. She's calm, she's collected until she needs to scream, springing forth from your crown chakra saying, I am powerful. I am me and I am okay. Stand back, you know, <laughs> like don't get in the way of the Athena when she's on a rampage and a good way. Of course, I'm not inciting violence. I'm saying this from an emotional perspective, being self-empowered and collected and ready to claim who you are as a woman. So now that we have some powerful work to look at with the Athena archetype and how to use it, allow me to share a screen again. I'm going to give you some wonderful tips and advice. You are welcome to take a photograph of the screen anytime throughout these presentations I'm doing. Take notes. And of course, um, in a few days, I will be sending you the replay so you can rewatch all of this for note taking purposes and your further work with all of this. So let me go ahead and share this again. So now we come to a fun part of the class where we talk about ways to invoke Athena, how to bring that energy about if we're stuck with the energy or we literally truly want to find ways to focus on using the energy of this incredible goddess. So manifesting the goddess of war, wisdom, and the arts. These are some tips. Using your clear-sighted wisdom to help guide you towards success. Being tactical before setting forth to conquer your shadows or obstacles in your path. Being inventive, creative, and masterful of your skills. Understand that balancing action and peace is a balance, like yin and yang, right? Having the authority to protect your domain and nourish it with your magical energy. Inspiring others around you to be heroic and courageous. It's not all about, you know, self-focus. It's also with the Athena, how to encourage, uplift, and support others. 
Then items of power you may find and surround yourself with are olives, olive tree symbolism, peonies, laurel. For animals, I recommend symbols of the owl. And if you are interested in the mythological creature, definitely Pegasus. And then you could have as jewelry items, for example, or decorative symbolism, spears, the Aegis shield, which she wore, which is the one that has the face of the head of Medusa in it. Nike, the goddess of victory, a plumed helmet, which is, of course, is the classic symbol when we think of Athena, where she wears the red plumed helmet, the gold, the Acropolis and statues of Pallas Athena. The, the one that was the ancient one that was up on the Acropolis. Artisan crafts, weaving, pottery, painting, etc. All the beautiful handicrafts, and there's so many of them, and supporting other artisans is really amazing to do. Then for essential oils, I recommend, of course, olive oil. Use it. You can use it as a skin softener, and you can eat it and delight in that lovely flavor. Laurel essential oil, spearmint, and cedarwood oils. Those are all lovely ones to use while working with the Athena archetype. And while we're going through all of this, then I am also going to pop you forward to journaling prompts. Now, these are the ones I definitely recommend writing down, and I will leave the share screen up for a few minutes after I go ahead and tell you all of these. Uh, so you have a chance to write them. Again, you can also take a photograph of the screen if you would like to. How do I use my voice of inner wisdom? Where in my life do I need to bring, I'm sorry, that's a typo. <laughs> where, how, where in my life do I need to bring more clarity, energy, and action? How can I use my creative skills to bring self-empowerment and inspiration into my life? What strategies do I need to implement assuring success of my ventures? And what steps do I need to take to bring them into fruition? How do I allow the Athena voice to uplift, encourage, and protect me? Those are all very good questions and prompts to think about in the days to come after this class and beyond whenever you're stuck in one of those moments and you need that clarity, uh, that wisdom, that's inner self-guidance. These are great questions and prompts to work with. And I recommend um, you're all in my One Circle group, and I invite the rest of you to join. That is Mystical Women's Circle in Facebook. Um, this is where I post a lot of these ideas, thoughts, and you are welcome to share your experiences of this class as well. I'm delighted to have you voice your thoughts there so we can start a discussion based on what you have been working on. So you're more than welcome to do so. I'll just give you another moment to review those and then I will go ahead and um, stop sharing the screen and we can have open forum. All right, I'll go ahead and stop sharing the screen. You may go ahead and unmute yourselves and join me for our open forum, which is very Athena. Athena would have definitely had open forums. <laughs> So would anybody like to share something that they have experienced or observed while learning about Athena today? Go ahead and unmute if you would like to.
Adrian, would you like to start? I see you. Yeah, I was, there's a couple of things I was I kind of make, made notes about here while you were talking. Mm -hmm. I was really curious about the the child that she mentored. Do you know the name? I I don't know as much about the child, and I do have my notes. Yeah. She did. She did. Um, have this person that she she cared for and i'm looking through my notes because actually this was a new thing to me i just i i knew about the issue with poseidon but i didn't know the full story about what that came so that was a newer tidbit for me too while studying yeah. this um, which is very interesting so let me see uh doo -doo 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 -doo. And if I don't see it in here, because I took a lot of notes, I always come with a lot of notes to class. Ah, yes, there we go. Okay, so um, Gaia was the one who gave birth to Eric Theon. Sorry, Eric Theonius. Eric Theonius. Eric Theonius, who is an important Athenian founding hero. Eric Theonius, okay. which makes me want to research this character more. Yeah. Um, because I didn't really know the full story of that. Uh, I knew about the issue at hand but in you know some of the myths or or stories we encounter are abridged and new discoveries are made or new translations so there's a lot of interesting things that come up but yeah that's an interesting thing so she took him under uh her wing and then he became um connected with the city of athens i paused because i'm like there's no way i remember his name after like learning it once <laughs> uh but yes, yeah, so that that's really interesting. So she took him under her wing just to just to be like that nurturing person in his life without having actually birthed him, but through the situation of how it all occurred, took that on, you know, because obviously that was, you know, a very strange experience. Um, and uh, because she was the the patron of Athens, it made complete sense that he would then be connected with the city of Athens. And she it, she wasn't only the patron of the one city; that was just the most famed location. She's an incredibly respected goddess all throughout Greece. So yeah, she she garnered garnered a lot of respect in different cities as well, as like the, one of the main gods too. You know, what I so find so so powerful about that is that she, I mean, she's obviously a goddess with boundaries, right? She's got a oh, little yeah. shield where it's like I can deflect and I can keep this safe, you know, and she has very clear like yes, no, <laughs> like not gonna marry, keeping my sovereignty. But at the same time, she's not afraid to nurture and she's not afraid to kind of use her more womanly, you know, because like there's a lot about her that's very yang, you know, she's like, <laughs> especially for a goddess, like there's a lot of yang in her. And so it was very interesting to me to hear those moments where she is more yin and she is more allowing of that, like you say, the womanly arts. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting, too, because although she does have a lot of young energy, she is actually the yin. And how would I say that yin doesn't necessarily mean passive to a degree, in my opinion, of like that feminine energy. So she's like the unbridled feminine power, right? That when that comes up. And I think, though, she does like have her aggressive side, which can be interpreted more as young we see aries really the god aries is that like visceral young uh, you know in your face aggressive energy so she really does keep her in check and although she isn't open to sexual liaisons with anyone she's also feminine like it that which is an interesting thing about i think about athena you know like she's she's open to that energy too yeah yeah yeah, but definitely. The other thing I wrote down um, that was interesting to me, so the story of Arachne, you know, mm. Um, mm. reminded me of the stories of Anansi Spider in West Africa. And ah. Anansi is a trickster god, and so it, he is very uh, witty, and he's very cutting, and he tells you the truth in a way that makes you go, wait, what? What did he just say? <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really interesting that I didn't know that Arachne had been weaving stories of kind of like telling on the gods mm -hmm. um, so that, but that fits in really well with that kind of trickster spider energy. And I can see how yeah. it's not. 
And it's it's interesting too because there are some myths that are reflected in cultures that didn't really have connection with each other but have similar stories all yeah. over the world. So that's a very interesting and a, a, a story to share because it, it's true and there's some there is some similarity there of the energetically between those two people. Definitely. Wow. Mm -hmm. Very good. Would anybody else like to share today? Monica, Leanne? Yes, good evening. Hello. Um, evening in Belgium. There it's morning, Wonderful. right? Good morning for you. Um, I love Adrian's enthusiasm. This time, I didn't feel any connection with the goddess, so I don't have much to say, actually. That's interesting. But yes, uh, it is interesting. Like with some goddesses, we feel a bigger connection with others less, apparently. So that is an interesting um, note for myself, I guess. It, that is very interesting. Uh, not uh, unimportant to work with that energy, though, when you need it. But she must not be your most prominent archetype. And you will know which archetypes you resonate with the most. And I have yes. a few of the different goddesses that I feel very drawn to. Um, and others that are less of a focus. And that's perfectly normal. Uh, it, it's like the, the latent aspects of our psyches or the ones that we don't call on to use very often. They're not like the most prominent um, personality traits that we have. So it's cool to notice that and honor that when it comes up. But I'd still invite you to do the, the, the goddess work this week and see what comes up when you start exploring that. What's interesting about that is that I, I don't, I've never particularly connected with Athena either. And as you know, I've been wanting to come to one of these and, but this was the one that like I showed up for. And I think it's because I'm needing this energy in my life right now. And I'm feeling that, that there is a lot of, like you were saying, people trying to tell me what my business is and trying mm -hmm. to tell me how to live my life. I'm getting a lot of those messages lately. And I've been really focusing on just like staying in my sovereign energy and just laughing that off and being like, okay, that's your opinion. <laughs> You're entitled to your opinion. But uh -huh. this, that that's shield, true. that shield image is really strong for me right now. Just oh, yeah. that like, I don't, I don't need to go on the attack, right? I, I can just hold up the shield. Yes, absolutely. That shield is energy. And yeah. it's a shield that deflects, protects, and and brings a sense of power. And her shield literally has the head of Medusa on it. So it's a major warning to anyone who would, you know, <laughs> mess with Athena. I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, it's a powerful symbol. And you can find it in art. Like, if you're looking for that, that's why I was mentioning things to look for. You can find, you know, classical artwork that uses the shield shape with the head of Medusa. I'm sure you've seen it in classical representations. That is literally what it is. Yeah, that's her shield, the shield of Athena. So that's very interesting. Yeah, and this happens to be the class you were able to come live to. And so this is part of the work I do with people too, um, with archetypes, is to see, okay, you may be in kind of a loop with a certain archetypal voice that you use a lot and perhaps it's not the one that you need to be working with now so how to look for the other voices to come up and support you when you need them so hey there you go you have your athena to work with and uh definitely contact me if you want to afterwards um discuss that further because it's exciting i love this work <laughs> monica what do you have for me today well, this is the one that I identify the most with. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so nice, nice. on, on more, a lot of different levels, uh, just like always being a, a fighter, I think, <laughs> um, for different causes and, um, and also being very protective. Um, and then of course, like just the, um, desire for, for um, knowledge and wisdom and, and things like that. Um, and then funny thing is that uh, my friend and I, um, we had, um, we founded an after school program for girls called the Athenas. <laughs> um, 
and it, it kind of and we haven't done it since covid but we we uh, did it it was like every other friday at one of the middle schools in calexico um <laughs> we would we would meet with a, a group of girls and it was all about kind of um you know and our our slogan was uh, knowledge is power um but but it was really to um to you know get the the girls together and and focused on you know setting goals for themselves and um, empowering themselves you know as they were going from you know seventh and eighth grade into um, high school and so that they kind of were um you know in a a good headspace before they before they got there and had some goals because we were finding that a lot of times um if they go to if they go to high school without having um any kind of goal then a lot of times they'll just you know they'll lose them <laughs> so yeah no and that's a really difficult time for a young woman to come yeah. in. Yeah, yes. and not have that support. So that's fantastic. I love that. And you embody that also being a teacher and yeah. an artist as well. So you, you definitely, I knew that going in. I was like, yes, yes, yes. This is going to resonate with Athena. There's no question. But I love the uh, the weave off. I mean, that was, <laughs> yeah. I, that, that just like, uh, it was great. It's like, don't challenge me. We're going <laughs> to. Well, and the interesting thing about that was that indeed Arachne had a point. It just was, if you wanted to survive or survive well, you didn't put it in their faces and be like, look what you guys did to us. You know, like, no, the gods don't like that. So she took a calculated risk there, you know, and it really backfired. But you know, no, no, none of the immortals appreciated having mortals try to be like, well, I'm better than they are. Take it on the chin. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm better than you are. <laughs> like, oh no, you're not. Let me prove to you the ways you're not. So uh, she was unwise to have done so. So, but then we have a fascinating story after the fact of ever weaving spider. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not sure who said this, but I've always loved this, uh, which is, I actually think what you asked for Oscar Wilde. Uh, or maybe Mark Twain. Mm. If you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. That's a good one. Yep. You're very good. We'll turn you into a spider. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, this has been just wonderful. Did anybody have any final comments or observations before I sign off for the day? Remember in the chat section below, if you found this valuable to you and you are here on the live, there is a donation link where you can support my work. Um, and uh, I will be sharing that to the, anyone who wants the, to receive it um, after watching the replay. And uh, I thank all of you for being here live with me today and gracing me with your powerful presence. And to everybody watching on the replay, I wish you abundant success with working with this powerful archetype. Thank you for the heart. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Bye for guys. being here. And I'll be posting more classes soon. Mwah. Bye.